verdade. There is no single ticket to visit the Sistine Chapel. A ticket you buy is a ticket to enter the Vatican Museums. Then, when you arrive early, you realize that you are not alone. In fact, there are crowds to enter the Vatican. People without tickets lining up to buy one. People who already have a ticket for a specific time and people with a guided tour. Literally, a crowd. And that crowd accompanies you through the long and sometimes narrow corridors to visit the same place. And, very important, there are many guided tours, many, many of them. The Vatican Museums are a money-making machine, and tour companies bring groups of 30, 40, and even more. In the end, what you see is this, a crowd of people seeing the same things, trying to capture the same photos, being pushed by two guys who are only interested in finishing in the time they have allowed and with a minimum effort, with the pace rushing through a maze of corridors until reaching the end, which is the Sistine Chapel. So. You can say my experience with the Vatican Museums and with the Sistine Chapel in particular is not very positive. In fact, the next time I will do it without a guide, with a single ticket to visit the Vatican Museums and the Sistine Chapel on my own pace.
In the Sistine Chapel, the guides cannot speak, so they say, those Vatican authorities have placed the reproduction of the Sistine frescoes on boards in the courtyard. And there, the guides offer a very brief recitative of what, literally, is the orthodox view of the Vatican authorities over the frescoes of the Florentine artists, and especially of Michelangelo. But the guides, at least the one in my tour, had very little information of substance that I didn't know. So, what's the point to have a guide who literally went pacing fast along all the places with very little things to say. I must say I was expecting in some degrees that, but the reality was even with that expectation really shocking. In my defense I must say I only took a guide tour because I couldn't get a single ticket in advance to enter the Vatican and I couldn't afford wasting time in the long line up to buy in place that ticket.
Oh boy. Here you go. Oh my god. Look at that. Quite a few people with their phones out, you're not going to get into trouble. Was it, was it, Make sure the guard doesn't see you smoking the blue yeah, top. I know, I know, I know, I saw it. difference between what is painting on the side and Michelangelo because he has a picture more stronger more pop up immediately 
Even this one that it has a big, uh, you know, big guys cannot com uh, compare with the big presence of uh, Michelangelo. It's incredible. And uh, look at. A little dog. Important right now, when we finish, we have the possibility to go in the basilica. Okay, yeah. The basilica. And then we go directly to the basilica. We go Today, your first glimpse of the magnificent frescoes will be far removed from what Michelangelo had in mind. The great portal of the pontiffs is closed to ordinary visitors. You will enter through the narrow door of the altar boys, located at one end of the room, just on the far right end of the universal judgment. So, the opposite way how Michelangelo wanted people to see the chapel ceiling frescoes. Then, the annoyed guards will direct you away from the altar area. You will find yourself pushed unceremoniously towards the center of the room, crowded with hundreds of visitors who have just overcome the complex labyrinth of the Vatican Museums. There, you will find yourself immersed in a crowd surrounded by the stern shout of the staff ordering you silence, no photography, no filming. By the way, the tour guides will warn you at the beginning of the visit that any breach of the strict etiquette at the Sistine will have consequences for them. It is another level of put you down again and they also move very quickly from the altar area to the end or middle of the chapel away from the universal judgment which you can only take a quick glance at. As soon as you enter the Sistine you feel overwhelmed. Your sight goes from the ceiling to the walls. Especially because you enter through the doors of the altar boys after climbing the stairs, the first things you stumble is the universal judgment. It is literally a shock. And then the ceilings and the walls and the floor. Many people ignore the floors overwhelmed by the multitude of frescoes and colors that surrounded them.
One important thing you notice is a notable difference between the frescoes on the walls painted by Florentine artists such as Perugino and Ghirlandaio and those painted by Michelangelo. Michelangelo's frescoes feel modern, it speaks more to us. The humanistic spirit is more noticeable in them than their sacredness. The style of Perugino and Botticelli's paintings is more stylized, archaic, with a certain rigidity in the figures. On the other hand, Michelangelo's are more fluid, the characters have a much more earthy and human profile, despite representing biblical scenes. In the paintings on the walls, the angels have wings, typical of the period before the Renaissance. Those of Michelangelo do not have them, as can be seen in the Universal Judgment. Also, the themes have a more faithful and detailed representation in the paintings on the walls than in those of Michelangelo's, in which many, if not all, focus on a central character and Michelangelo in a certain way speaks to us through them. It is as if the frescoes were reproducing more earthy characters in those of Michelangelo and more heavenly mythical ones in those of the previous Florentines. A speciality, even in scenes like those of the Universal Judgment, is also different. In general, the frescoes on the walls have the air of being theatrical representation of biblical themes. In those by Michelangelo, the atmosphere is more realistic. The figures have a natural pose and a different dimensionality in a space. They are more robust and earthy. Something truly remarkable, although much more robust, their movements are more fluid and natural. They feel, even when some seem to float, as if they are anchored to the air. The Vatican insists that Michelangelo portrays the ancestor of Christ. This reading is the one shared by the Sistine Guides. However, it is not congruent with the choices the artist made. Why did Michelangelo choose Zechariah, one of the last and least known Jewish prophets, who appears located just above the main door, a prominent place through which the popes enter, and where Julius II had asked the artist to draw Christ? Nor is it understood some of the choices of scenes and events in the Bible, from the book of Genesis, Torah for the Jews, especially Noah's drunkenness, to cite an example. Weren't there more edifying facts to represent? Why do so many obscene gestures abound in frescoes that are supposed to offer an edifying image of Christ's ancestors? Just to cite a few, the gesture of the putty behind Zachariah. When God is creating the moon, Michelangelo paints him, showing his naked behind. Curiously, in English, this action is called mooning. I mean a bad gesture with his left hand, among others. These are a few examples. 
but there are many more. There is scenes taken from the Bible that Michelangelo alters, some in the way that totally contradicts the Vatican version of the frescoes repeated by tourist guides or in tourist publications. For instance, the representation of Haman's death. Another of the contradictions that Michelangelo's frescoes show is in his choice of the sepals. The three pagan sepals, who were commonly accepted by the church, were the Tiburtine, the Hellespont, and the Samos. However, none of them are in the Sistine. There is another interesting detail that we notice when we see the representation of these pagan figures. Their evident masculinity, especially in their musculature. When we see Michelangelo's frescoes, we are also struck by the repetitive use of hand gesture, especially the fingers. In fact, in many scenes, the most obvious gesture is made with the fingers. In the creation of Adam, for instance, God and Adam touch each other with their index fingers. Daniel also makes a significant gesture with his index finger. Isaiah also points his index finger. In Joel, we see the putty to the left of him pointing once again with his index finger. The sepal of Komai also gesture with her index finger beneath the book she holds. The same is true for Eritrea and Delphi, without forgetting the obscene gesture of the putty behind Zecharia and that of Aminabad, who is the only figure in the entire fresco by Michelangelo that looks at us directly in the face. Too many fingers, I would say. None of this happens, for instance, in the frescoes on the walls, made by Michelangelo's Florentine predecessors. Finally, what is most striking in the Sistine is the obvious divorce between what the Vatican preached in his advertising manuscript about the frescoes and what one actually sees there. It is, of course, more evident now that the paintings have been restored and we can see them as they were originally created. That's why it is important before visiting to read and know what you are going to see. It is the best way to take advantage of the time, the little time we have, and to obtain our own opinion about what we can see there. In my opinion, the best way to visit the Sistine is alone, with a single ticket, without any tourist guide. Then you could pay the entrance fee, and although the cars intimidatingly direct you away from that area, you have more chance to see it up close in more detail. The Vatican says the Sistine Chapel is a holy place, but there is no liturgical actions taking place anytime in it. Only when the Pope died, the Cardinal College has a meeting there to elect the new Pope. Nevertheless, the staff members in the Sistine Chapel don't allow you to take pictures and videos of what it is a universal cultural heritage. The works of the great artists who in the past created the frescoes that today protect the walls and ceiling of the Sistine Chapel belong to all of us. No one is a jealous owner of this world cultural treasure. Nobody can be.
And so I decide to take the risk and take a video, despite the dozen guards and staff members inside the system who constantly harass visitors who can only observe for very few minutes the extraordinary frescoes on his walls and ceiling. I must say, I have no regrets, and I would do it one more time if I could do it. Although I will not reveal the way I did it, in case of any member of the Vatican staff sees the video and tries to take future actions against those of us who will visit the Sistine Chapel. A photograph and a video does not offend anyone. And in my opinion, what they try to do with those who visit the Sistine is to shorten their stay in order to allow a graded flow of public and money. Money, that's the key word. The Sistine, like the Vatican Museums, are a meal for a public money. When you enter the Sistine, look at the frescoes on the ceiling, but also look at those on the walls. There are also wonderful works by great Florentine artists, such as Perugino, Botticelli, Ghirlandaio, and Signorelli. The visit is oriented for only 20 minutes, and I'm telling you, the guys stay much less than that. However, you go alone, you can stay longer, and if you are constantly moving, you can extend your visit without the system staff noticing. My other advice is, it is always good to know in advance what you are going to see, its history, the detail of how those frescoes were made, how and why the system was built. It makes the visit to that place much more enriched by knowing those details. There is a lot of material on the internet, especially on YouTube. Watch them. I recommend two magnificent books. First, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling by Ross King and the Sistine Secrets by Benjamin Black and Roy Doliner.